You're listening to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, dedicated to the 40 plus community. Join us as we discuss the truth about fitness and health using science, reason, and the experiences of our host and content experts. Welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. Hey, welcome back to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, and welcome back to the 40 Fit Nation. I'm your host, Coach D, and I'm also here with co-host, Coach Trent. Yo, yo, yo. And this morning, we're going to talk about our last in our three-part series of Strong Shoulders, and it's going to be called Strong Shoulder Exercise and Interventions. And so we're going to talk about the different types of exercises that we use. Um, and really, more than that, we're going to talk about, and Trent and I were just talking about this offline or, or off mic you might say. Um, And we're going to talk about some concepts, some bigger overreaching concepts, which frame the way that we train um, both injured and non-injured shoulders as myself as a doctor of physical therapy and a starting strength coach and as Trent as a coach too. So we're going to talk about those concepts today and, and to go over that and then mention and then highlight some of the exercises that we really like that we feel um, based on research and based on practical and professional experience um, and some anecdotal evidence that really are effective to uh, get shoulders stronger and give you a lot of health as you grow into your older years uh, with upper body lifting. I, I, I just want to know one thing. Yes. How do I build cannonball delts? Cannonball I want, delts. I want cannonballs <laughs> in my shoulder. I want to have three heads. PEDs. <laughs> <laughs> Performance enhancing. Duly no, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right, so let's let's start first with just saying let's let's talk about a couple basic principles. And the first principle I want to say is this: if you're out there and you've been doing upper body work, whether it be in your fitness program, CrossFit, barbell training, you're a triathlete and you're swimming and you're you're biking or whatever you're doing, whatever your chosen sport or fitness endeavor is, if you're out there and you're having shoulder pain and it's creating significant movement dysfunction, let me just say first as a disclaimer, you need to figure out why you're hurting. You need to have an accurate diagnosis and you need to figure out why the shoulder is hurting. What is producing the pain that you're having? Is it mechanical pain? Is it chemical um, irritative pain? Is it uh, you know a structural issue? There are a lot of different things that can cause pain. Um, is it acute pain, subacute, chronic pain? We've talked about this in our in our um, podcast about uh, pain science, and so you need to find out what's causing the pain because that in and of itself will determine the treatment plan. And in my model, as a as a doctor of physical therapy in the clinical setting, I always want to know up front what the diagnosis is. Now, to be honest with you, there are some occasions where the diagnosis is just kind of evades us. It's it's kind of a gray area or where the patient really doesn't present with a clear clinical presentation and diagnostics don't necessarily confirm whether it be an MRI, an arthrogram, whatever the testing is, ultrasound, what we want to see. So we use a reasonable medical guess based on our experience and what we see in the clinic. And we come up with a treatment plan and a plan of care and intervene with uh, certain uh, modalities and interventions, exercise, resistance training, manual therapy, whatever the treatment is, um, and see what happens. You know, I always tell my patients, I'm going to do one of three things. I'm going to get you better, worse, or you're going to be the same. (laughs) The goal is to get them better. But sometimes you get them a little worse (laughs) on the front end, and it immediately cues you, you know, clues you in to something. You go, aha, it's that. Yeah, That's yeah. what I need to treat. Look, we did this. And and the other thing here is one. So, so that is one overreaching principle. Pain can cause movement dysfunction and can cause, and when I say movement dysfunction, you're just not moving right, or you can't move in a particular right, right. exercise or motion. Yeah. It goes back to the, the pain series that we did on lower back pain, you know, but it applies yeah. to anything, shoulders, knees, right. hips, uh, that yeah, pain can cause you to start moving incorrectly in anticipation of the pain, 
or you know it, there may be a mechanical issue too right, going right. on. That yeah, just, there could be a yeah. compensation and and um, uh, some type of some type of adaptation to the pain. But but it doesn't mean though, and we'll talk about this second principle that you have to wait for the pain to go pain to go away to do strength training, right? Or to do resistive training. So we 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 used to kind of think that as a general thought process in the clinic. And now after years of research and just, and just treating patients over the years, I don't necessarily wait for pain to fully go away because it very well likely may be that the strength training that we intervene with is the thing that's going to get rid of their pain. Right, right. And so that is the treatment. And so we have to we have to get that patient or client in our gym to buy into the fact that um, they're going to have to do a little bit of uh, movement with a little bit of pain. Now, I'm not talking about severe pain or pain right, that right. keeps you from doing the movement, but but they're going to have to go through that a little bit. And and we're definitely not saying no pain, no gain either, because that's right, not yeah. true either. Yeah, it, it's yeah. it's a it's an educated viewpoint and um, a logical viewpoint that the strength training itself is a form of treatment. Yeah, and, and like we said again in that pain series, um, you know, pain is a subjective experience to some extent. So people are gonna have different, different experiences of pain regardless of the whatever biomechanical thing might be going on, right? Right, right, and so, so our goal is up front. So the first concept is, is that if you've got major pain, major pain, but if you've got, <laughs> this is an old movie reference, but if you've got some major pain and you there are certain motions you just can't do because it hurts too much, get that seen by a medical doctor, a, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, a doctor of physical therapy, but get that seen first. Okay, yeah, so that, that was what, I'm gonna, what I wanted to ask you is uh, we didn't really cover this in the previous episode, but is there, you know, what kind of physician do you want to see if you trying to get a good diagnosis? Sure. You know, I, I, if, if I have a client that comes to me with shoulder pain and I need a referral back for physical therapy, because in the state of Texas, you have to have a referral from an MD or DO or another physician to, to, to see the patient, which hopefully will change that in this next legislative session. Go vote for direct access physical therapy in the state of Texas <laughs> okay. for this legislative session in What proposition is that? Is there a number? I can't remember the House bill or Senate bill, um, but maybe I can look it up in between now and the end of the podcast. Too. All right. If you live in or Texas, we'll, let's put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. So if you live in Texas, um, we'll, we'll put a link there for yes. the bill and uh, go and vote And go for call it. your senator or your um, state representative and tell them you support House bill so-and-so or you support Senate bill so-and-so which will allow you to go off the street and see a doctor of physical therapy without another physician's referral. It's ridiculous in the state of Texas. We are one of only two states out of 50 states that still doesn't allow direct access. And the other state will probably get it before we do. Wow. So that's how slow and behind Texas is. So go vote for that. But, but I would say if, if I'm going to send a patient who's a shoulder patient, first of all, I might send them, send them to a sports medicine ortho that's a shoulder specialist, a fellowship trained shoulder specialist, someone okay. who does nothing but shoulders. If not, and that's not available, then I'll probably send them to an orthopedist or a non-surgical um, orthopedist that does physical medicine and rehab, maybe a PM and R guy, physical medicine and re rehabilitation. They call him a physiatrist that does sports medicine work or your family practitioner. Really all I need is a referral right. for physical therapy. And then I can do a PT diagnosis in clinic, but you do need an accurate diagnosis. And um, the clinical presentation to me is generally what I see in the clinic is generally much more important to me than what I see actually on an MRI. Sure. Um, yeah. Now an arthrogram, a little bit more accurate, a higher level of sensitivity and specificity. And also an ultrasound, pretty accurate. But MRIs can be misleading. I've had patients that have come in with MRIs that say they have a full thickness cuff tear or patients that say they have no cuff tear. And it'd be just the opposite when they go in and they do an arthroscopy or they later do an arthrogram because the patient's not getting better. Yeah. So um, I think it's important that you put the whole picture together. Diagnostics, you know, you are not your MRI and diagnostics um, test combined with clinical exams and clinical tests, orthopedic tests, and what the patient tells us on the medical history, all combined together to give us an accurate diagnosis. And especially with the shoulder, extremely important. The shoulder is a very complicated joint. Um, a lot of things refer to the shoulder, a lot of other areas, 
the the cardiac system refers to the shoulder the pulmonary system refers to the shoulder um, the pancreas can refer to the shoulder and create shoulder pain um, the spleen can refer to the shoulder the cervical spine the neck can refer pain to the shoulder so there's all these different conditions that can refer um, other diagnoses that can refer to the shoulder so we want a good accurate um, starting diagnosis, and then we can treat with the proper interventions. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, you can't fix a car's brakes if you don't know if it's the brakes that are the problem. Right. You know, if you're working <laughs> on the steering linkage, then and it's the brakes that the problem. You're not going to solve the the problem. So it's yeah, same, exactly. Same exactly. principle. So our overreaching principle number one is that pain, bad pain, needs to be um, addressed on the front end with an accurate diagnosis. Um, before you have your intervention, whether it be in a clinical or a gym setting. Now, our second principle is that we don't always, though, have to clear movement dysfunction. In other words, we don't have to get rid of move movement dysfunction and some discomfort um, before we start strength training. We can do those things in, in, um, in unison, and we can do those things at the same time as long as the movement dysfunction and the pain is not to a severe enough level to where it's really going to hurt the shoulder long term. Right. Yeah, in the gym, we see that all the time um, when people first start with us. Uh, most people, especially men over a certain age, have some shoulder dysfunction. Now, yeah, they, they don't have normal flexion. Right. Yeah. They, they're now, they don't have 180 degrees. No, of 160 range of maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, granted, they're, they usually don't have any injuries when they're, uh, when they walk into the gym, but, uh, you know, there's certainly nothing stopping them from, uh, training through that, even though it's going to cause some discomfort, right? They feel a little bit of pain or discomfort rather when they're in that low bar squat position with the shoulders retracted when they're holding the rack position of a shoulder press, um, or even in the bench press, you know, when they're pulling those shoulder blades back and creating an arch with their chest. Sure. But it's the act of, it's the act in those first few weeks in particular, it's the act of training and assuming those positions that makes them feel better. Right, anyway. right. Yeah, I mean, the strength training itself is therapeutic. It is treatment. It is medicine. Right. Um, the strength training, like like Sully, our colleague that wrote Barbell Prescription. So, and, and this is important, right? The reason we say this, it sounds obvious when we say it, but it's important because how many people, how many sources do you see out there saying- Stop training if you're saying, hurt. Well, you don't have 180 degrees of shoulder mobility. Yeah, you shouldn't be doing You shoulder. need to do at least six weeks of mobility work before right, you do right. anything. No, no. Our strength training is our mobility work. If we intervene with the correct, and this is this is another principle we'll talk about in a minute, but if we intervene with the correct strength training exercise regime, then our strength training is our mobility work. And we will add some stretches in there, mostly some dynamic stretches or stretches under load. Um, because that's where the best efficacy is, but, um, our strength training is part of our treatment and, um, strength training, you know, strength training and exercise is the best medicine. I mean, was it Socrates that, who, who said, uh, what, what philosopher said that? Is it Socrates that said that, that exercise is the best medicine? I was, uh, uh, oh, you know, I think that was Hippocrates. Yo, Hippocrates yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, let, yeah. let, uh, yeah, let uh, exercise and Food, be, food thy medicine. be thy medicine or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're real learned. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, a, a great philosopher. He's turning in his grave right now. So. Yes. Yes. So one of our guys from online, great books could probably quote that the whole, the yeah. whole paragraph. So, um, uh, just a little, Hey, a little, 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 little um, uh, plug for, um, uh, online, great books.com and, and for, um, Scott Hambrick's business. So it's a great, great thing to learn some of their Western works of, um, uh, literature and, and learn a little bit more about who you are and, and what your purpose is. So, um, okay. Uh, as I said, so we've got this first principle about pain. We got the second principle about that. You don't always have to get rid of pain before you start with, um, strength training or some other type of training intervention, because that in and of itself, um, will, or might be treatment and might be self healing in its nature. Now, when that occurs, I mean, you, you have to take your best guess at it unless you have some some educated eyes on you. If you have a doctor of physical therapy in the area that believes in strength training, if you have a doctor that believes in strength training, and really, to be honest with you, if you have a starting strength coach in your area, I just referred a client that was living up in the Pennsylvania area, actually, or Philly area, I think, and um, he... Um, 
you know, had this problem and that problem. And I said, I went online and I found a starting strength coach pretty close to him within an hour. And I said, go see this guy. Yeah. And yeah. Um, because I trust that guy enough to say that he's going to look at things uh, logically. He's going to, he's going to have the right underlying principles and infrastructure of mindset to set up a program. And then he's going to reach out to the proper medical professionals if he needs to, if he can't get his client to move forward. That's what I love about the starting strength coaching community. It's hard, crazy hard to become a starting strength coach, as you know. Yes. And um, at the same time, the the people that are starting strength coaches, the experts in the strength world, they, um, they're they a great resource. Another great resource would be, because you're asking about professionals, would be a really good CrossFit coach, a coach that understands barbell training, a coach that understand, that has a good balanced view. And you can't throw all coaches in one community into a bad basket and all coaches coaches in another community to a good basket. You have to evaluate that coach by coach and go and interview them. Ask them, you know, how many clients have they worked with with shoulder problems? How many clients have they worked with that are older clients, over 40? How many clients do they, what do they think about barbell training, resistance training? If you go to a personal trainer and their number one tool is not resistance training, and they have mobility as their number one tool. Yoga is their number one tool. Um, run uh, away. Cardiovascular work. What? <laughs> run away. <laughs> yes, run away. Don't don't walk, run, and hide. Save your but money. That's right. Save your money because the, the best thing that we can do as a strength coach uh, or trainer, coach, fitness expert, is to uh, make an organic change in your muscle development um, so that you move better and you can function better. So the second principle is you don't always have to get rid of movement dysfunction or, or get rid of pain before you start movement. The movement itself and the exercise itself can be treatment in and of itself. The third principle is that when you have a significant shoulder injury that is um, that damages uh, well, let's just talk about this. In, in previous episodes, we talked about the last two episodes on the shoulder. We talked about the shoulder anatomy and physiology. Then we talked about some of the shoulder diagnosis that occur, the problems, pathologies that occur, the itises that occur in the shoulder. And, and really, many times, we're not very often talking about the big primary movers that become a problem. Very few people get deltoiditis. <laughs> right, know? right. I mean, it's just a large muscle. Now you can tear your deltoid and you can get, you know, uh, a subdeltoid bursitis and you can get some of these other conditions. But the deltoid is a bigger primary mover. It's got a big muscle belly. You can strain it. Um, I've seen athletes that have had it strained or lifters. I've also seen like people that have a C5 nerve injury, an axillary nerve injury, and they get a paresis or a weakening of the deltoid muscle. But the deltoid is probably the most um, uh, durable of all the shoulder muscles, along with the upper trap, the upper trap and the right. deltoid um, and some of the scapular stabilizers, the rhomboids. You can tear your rhomboids, though, pretty easy. Um, not easy, but you can tear them. Um, your serratus, you can tear. I've torn my serratus anterior when I was a gymnast in high school and college. I tore my serratus anterior doing a movement. But... But the deltoid and the upper traps, by and large, are very durable, and they're big primary movers. You know, they create the coupling of the shoulder, um, glenohumeral joint, um, and scapulohumeral joint. They help the shoulder to move correctly, and they're big mover muscles. And then you have, like we talked about, all those secondary musculature, right. we'll call the stabilizers in our last episodes, um, and those would be your your rotator cuff musculature, your supraspinosa, infraspinosa teres, and subscapularis. Um, and then, and then also your long head of your biceps could be considered a primary mover of the shoulder. Um, so maybe we should have mentioned it uh, in the uh, earlier ones. Yeah. Well, we, we referred to it as, as sort of, uh, it's a shoulder flexor, right. And it also sort of helps to sling or yes. depress that humerus in the joint. Well, so that's it, my so theory. For, that's your theory. That's right? my theory. Yeah. And, yeah. and we haven't proven that with liter with research or literature, but that's my theory. And I also, I'd love, I think we're going to do a podcast coming up on soon on, on why some people get bicep tendonitis really bad, um, proximal bicep tendonitis, long head bicep tendonitis, and how it refers down to the elbow when they, when they're in a barbell program. Cause I think I, I've seen some trends that we want to elucidate highlight, mm -hmm. but so then you've got your long hand or your bicep, and then you've got all the scapular stabilizers. But when we talk about down deep into the joint and these littler mus muscles, like the rotator cuff muscles, if you have a significant injury in the rotator cuff muscles, whether it be from a rotator cuff tendon tear, 
whether it be from um, weakness over time due to calcific tendonitis or pain syndromes that have occurred and you have um, uh, compensated and you have kind of um, babied the shoulder. Um, and, um, and you've got significant pathology in one of those muscles in that muscle group. Maybe you have a nerve palsy like the suprascapular nerve or infrascapular nerve has um, become damaged or there's, uh, you know, a cervical neuropathy, meaning, meaning that you have a cervical uh, a peripheral neuropathy where, where the, the nerve root has been uh, damaged through one way or another. So you have a weakness, but there is a structural weakness in the muscle belly. I'm a, I'm a strong believer that, and, and, I, and I'm going to say something out there that the strength world might poo-poo on me, you know, and say, oh, that's bull. But I'm a strong believer that there, there is some, there are and is some value to using, strengthening in some isolation movements, um, the stabilizer musculature of the shoulder, um, along with um, the big primary movements like shoulder press, bench press, chins, rows, those bigger movements. I'm a strong believer that you you do need to strengthen um, some of those stabilizers, those secondary musculature in isolation for some of the exercise training intervention. Yeah. And so let's take this back to the first episode in this series, back to anatomy and function, right? Um, so the secondary movers are responsible for some of the range of motion that the joint has, right? And in, in uh, making that possible. Correct. Correct. Right. So if we're only training the primary movers with, say, like an overhead press or a row or whatever, then we're not really exposing that joint to range of motion during the training. We're, we're exposing it to a certain range of motion, right? Like an overhead range of motion, but we're not taking it all the way through um, extension and flexion like you might in, say, like a sport, right? If you have a sport you're trying to rehab for that, it re that requires rotation of the arm, you're not really training that with the big barbell movement, let's say. Well, I do believe that there is this concept that if we, be if we build a basic string, you know, when we talk about sports-specific training, um, I, I think that's more in practice than it is anything else and not right. actually strength training. You don't need to strength training, strength train muscles in a sport specific manner necessarily other than if you're a swimmer and you don't have strong you need to build the lats so you need to have a big lat moving exercise so the deadlift um chins um barbell rows pullovers you know pull downs those are big lat moving exercises you know squats you know to build the lats um right as, right. A, as a spine stabilizer so but but i'm i'm a strong believer that a, a good example would be this if the deltoids are a really strong muscle and they have not been significantly um, limited or damaged, and let's say you have a you have a full thickness cuff tear that has just had surgery, and so it's been repaired, that muscle is shut down. Now, when I mean shut down, there's so much pain in the region, so much inflammation in the region, the musculature is just hard to contract. And if people want to poo-poo that idea and they don't believe that that's true, just go have an ACL recon of your knee and see how hard it is to contract your quad when there's any more than 30 cc's of, of swelling or fluid in the distal quad um, where some of the motor units are. You almost can't contract your quad. Two reasons. Number one, pain. Number two, swelling and an imbalance in um, uh, electrolytes and um, uh, an imbalance in the contractile uh, chemicals in the distal muscul musculature. So... Um, your, your quad wants to shut down. Well, the exact same thing happens in the shoulder. We just don't see it as well because we can't see the cuff musculature contract. We just know that the motion's not happening. So I'm a strong believer on the front end that if you're not careful and you just start, let's say, the press overhead alone as your primary exercise activity, the deltoid is strong enough that it can eventually um, do the motion for you, but you still have a significantly weak cuff. Now, are you going to strengthen your cuff with the overhead press? Yes, you sure, are. Sure. Yeah. But in the ratio that it needs to be strong, can the deltoid allow you to start going overhead earlier and be doing the motion? And it looks reasonably good as motion because let's say if they did an acromioplasty, they cleared out the bottom of the joint, they cleaned up the junk. The motion has better freedom of movement anyway. Now, because there's more space, there's more margin for movement. And so the person's moving overhead and it looks like they're doing reasonable movement, maybe a little bit of compensation, but they still have a really weak cuff. So I do like 
as part of our interventions to do some isolated cuff work with someone that I know has a deficient rotator cuff. Okay. Someone that yeah. I know yeah. has a deficient group of secondary stabilizers. Okay. So that's an important distinction. Again, um, we're not talking about if you're a baseball pitcher going out and throwing a weighted baseball to quote unquote train the cuff. It's for someone who has an injury that they're trying to rehab from, then that calls for a dedicated cuff work, right? We're not just going to do it off just because, right? No. If, if I've got someone, a good example is if I've got a pitcher and he has no dysfunction in movement, he's got fast speed throwing, he's got good mechanics, and I test his rotator cuff in the clinic and he's strong, I'm going to do the press with him. <laughs> right, right. I'm probably going to do the, I'm going to do the press, I'm going to do barbell rows, I'm going to do uh, shrugs with him. I'm going to uh, do bench press if he can tolerate it, um, if he doesn't have any problems with it. Um, I will probably add in some dumbbell, some more dumbbell isolated work, like for his bicep, bicep flexion, scaption, um, uh, kind of some front raise type motions. Um, and then I'll probably add um, uh, chins in there or lat pull downs. Yeah. And that's all I need to do with him. That's all I need to do with his shoulder. If I can get reasonably heavy loads in those motions, and then I also, you know, you got to understand something that you're, you're building a strength um, foundation, but these guys throw 50 pitches, you know, 30 pitches. So they have to have some stamina too. Right. So, you know, I might have some rep schemes in there too, closer to their, their competitive season that represents a little bit more stamina training too. Sure. To build their ability to basically tolerate the number of volume. And they're going to do that through their pitching program, yeah. through their interval throwing program. They're going to do that anyway. But I'm going to use those big musculature primary movers. Now, um, as this, if we're talking about this, this um, third principle, secondary and primary movers, if I have someone that has a torn rotator cuff like I did, I had a, fi I had a four anchor cuff repair, I had a full thickness supraspinatus tear. Um, I was pressing PVC in the ring press that we show um, within uh, two weeks post-op at least, yeah. maybe earlier. Um, but it was no weight. It was PVC in the rings and doing what I call walkouts. We call them press walkouts and then overhead press to the, from my head to the top. And, but it was, um, really passive range of motion mostly cause I was letting the rings do the work. Right. Um, and then I was still in my sling for six weeks, you know, I was in an immobilizer for six weeks. The reason for that is we're allowing that tendon to purchase, we're allowing that tendon to grow into the bone. I can't accelerate that growth other than good nutrition, good sleep, lots of growth hormone yeah, <laughs> or whatever, yeah. you know? I mean, I can't, I can't accelerate that growth. It's based on my genetics and my general health. But movement and motion early on was lotion right. to the joint. And then once I can start loading it, I did do some uh, band work for isolated external rotation. Um, but I really like the dumbbell. I like light dumbbells. Okay, yeah. Um, so let's tend in strength. Let, let's kind of outline that uh, pretty clearly. Like, what what are some of your favorite methods for training the cuff? Okay, so first of all, if I had to pick the top exercises that I would use for training the shoulder, training the shoulder period, it would be the press first. Okay. Yep. Um, That's kind of the king of yeah, of yeah shoulder yeah. exercises, right? Yeah, it would longest be range of motion, longest yeah. kinetic chain, most recruited muscle mass, most muscle mass. Yeah, I mean you're using the whole body. It works your core. It works everything. You know, um, it works your balance. It works your coordination. It's a great exercise for the older population too. Plus, it's just cool. Yeah, like, there's something well, about yeah, lifting I mean, something over your head. Yeah, you know, I mean it's, heavy. it's classic. <laughs> the strict press is just yeah. a classic movement, and the way we teach it either in the 1.5 or the 2.0 press with a little bit of hip drive or bounce off the bottom you can get a lot of weight overhead um but i like the press yep. um i like i like um bench press too but i think there are some older lifters some older individuals that the bench press has just gotten painful over time some of them just can't do it anymore right. there's enough there's enough wear and tear on the long head of the biceps enough wear and tear maybe on the labrum the articular cartilage um uh the enough wear and tear on the cuff that it's just it's just a painful movement so to substitute for that, I will do push-ups, weighted push-ups, or I will do um, dumbbell bench press. And I have found that lots of ladies and guys that are older can do heavy dumbbell bench presses. I mean, I do, I can do 110s, 120s yeah. with reps of, of six, you know, three sets of six, four sets of six with dumbbell bench press, but I cannot 
I, benching 225 on the bench hurts my shoulders significantly because it's a restrained movement pattern. Right. I right. have to have my shoulders there. So using the dumbbells, I can rotate a little bit. And I hate to say it, but I can cheat a little bit. Yeah, it's almost like a, you can get you can approximate more of like a close grip barbell bench press as well as rotate your wrists to to change the amount of uh, elbow you know, well, by, you by have, rotating right? the wrist into more, um, into a, a more supinated position, I can take some of the link tension off the long head of the biceps right, right. because of the way it functions and the whole length of the bicep. So there's some, there's a lot of mechanics at work yeah. there. The number one thing is a lot of flexibility. As yeah. As long yeah. as I'm doing, um, a proper movement, I'm not doing a harmful movement, like, like a dumbbell press with my arms at 90 degrees, which is yeah, an that's no good. position. Yeah. Um, as long as I'm keeping the shoulder down and then there's a lot of variance for movement opportunity there, which for me is very effective and I can still work my chest. Um, uh, let's talk about, I also love, uh, chins. I think the chin up is a very effective exercise. I, I do pull ups on some occasions, but I don't like the pull up as an exercise, um, for someone that has cuff problems or that has impingement problems just because of the mechanical nature of what position it puts the shoulder in. I think the chin up is a lot better to protect the rotator cuff, to recruit more muscle mass, to um, also stretch the lats better at the bottom of the range of motion. So we've got the press, we've got the bench press, we've got dumbbell presses, uh, dumbbell bench press if needed. We've got chin ups. Um, we've got barbell rows. I love barbell rows. We've also talked about weighted push-ups. We've got barbell rows. I think the barbell row is a very effective exercise for posterior scapular, posterior shoulder development, the posterior chain of the shoulder, the traps, the scapular stabilizers, the rhomboids, the teres, all those big muscles too, or the teres um, musculature to his stabilizers. Um, and it also works the biceps a lot and the posterior deltoids. So, um, that's a great exercise. I also like, um, exercises that most people wouldn't think are big shoulder developers. I like the back squat, but, and I like the, the way we teach the back squat, which is a low bar back squat. I like the way that the bar gets down and, and the elbows are tucked down and in and the grip is narrow. So it requires a nice external rotation, position for the shoulder and gets a stretch on under load right. while strengthening the lats and the upper back and the traps. And so it's a great shoulder developer and period. Here's the secret guys, a little secret for everybody is that the squat in and of itself will add mass to your upper body. If you're not doing anything else. Yeah. Because it increases your total growth hormone level, increases your testosterone level, and it's the most effective uh, multi-joint muscle mass mover of all the exercises, of all the lifts. Yeah. So the squat in and of itself will make your upper body bigger. Sure. It'll, it'll grow your and, neck. And if, you've, <laughs> and if you've ever squatted a heavy weight, I mean, you know that just standing up with a heavy weight in yeah. your back, that, your shoulders yeah. aren't taking a break. No, your upper you know, back is tight. You are you're, tight. It's, it's yeah. tough. It's yeah. just tough to hold that position. Yeah. You're even, a so. rigid lever to yeah. be ready to lift. Um, and then I also like the deadlift. I think the deadlift is a fantastic shoulder developer. Um, you know, when you get into that deadlift position with that high hip and you're, you're pulling that bar up, um, your, your shoulders are in a stabilizing motion. Your upper traps are in a stabilizing motion. Your posterior deltoid, um, your biceps, everything in the shoulder girdle is, is locked on tight, um, in an isometric stabilizing motion. So your cuff gets a lot of work there. I love the deadlift for cuff rehab because it's a great isometric stabilizer. Yeah, that's so right. External rotation, big chest, squeezing those rhomboids back, a great exercise to work um, the shoulder cuff. You know, the other thing I would add in there would be lat pull downs if someone can't chin. I like the lat pull down. Um, and then as more isolated exercises, because those are the big movers yeah, mostly. Right. As more isolated exercise, I will intervene with dumbbell sideline external rotations of the shoulder. So I'll have them lay on their side, the shoulder that's up towards the ceiling side or the upside. I'll put a towel roll under their um, armpit to get them abducted just a little bit to put the cuff in a better link tension relationship at about 30 degrees or 40 degrees of abduction. And then they'll do external rotations. Um, I also like um, shrugs, heavy um, shrugs. 
uh, unilateral, you know, with dumbbells. Um, I like doing that. I also like uh, prone, lying on a bench or lying on a table, um, prone rows. Okay. I like yep. those two with a close elbow and a little bit wider elbow. I like that too. Prone rows with a little bit wider elbow, say at 45 degrees. Sure. Yep. Um, for scapular now, and posterior deltoid building. Now, do you like to do those on like an inclined bench? To, or, or, or a flat I do them bench. Flat. I okay, do them flat, flat mostly. I mean, you can do them on an incline, but I'll do them flat mostly. Uh, I also like, um, you know, uh, with lighter dumbbells, I like the T's and Y's and W's. Um, I don't think they create significant shoulder strength, but I think they're good for the secondary stabilizers. Um, but I will do T's and Y's and W's. That's not our foundation of our program, but I want to see the quality of movement of the scapulohumeral joint. I want to see if they can stabilize, if the movement looks clean, and I can do that with either just the weight of the arm or with light dumbbells. Okay, yeah, so I, I think I can see, I can visualize the T, right, mm -hmm. standing up straight, the arms out at 90 degrees, Ys would be up above the head, Yeah. right? And actually, all of these what are done bent over. All these are done bent over. Oh, bent over, Yeah, okay. with the hips at about, um, with the hips at about 60 degrees of flexion and the back straight, and the T is done down in front of you, and reaching back. Okay. The Y is done down in front of you, your hips and reaching up into a Y position. So it's the position we're making basically with the trunk. Yeah. Okay. The T is the arms out to the side with the trunk and 90 degrees. The Ys are at about 140 degrees, 130 degrees. And the W's are coming straight back and then externally rotating. Okay. Like out. a cactus. Yeah. Yeah. Seen, yeah. yeah. Pretend exactly. Like, like a, a three headed yeah. cactus. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I think, yeah, yeah, I like those two. So I think what what we need to do in addition to this podcast, we need to do a video. Yeah, we're going to do some videos on uh, some of these specific uh, isolation movements that are that are less well known. There's plenty of documentation on how to squat, how to row, all that good stuff. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I think we need to do some some uh, isolation type exercises that people can use that are trying to rehab. Yeah, and I think I think here's the overreaching principle here that that everybody needs to hear on this podcast, and that is, um, uh, like we talked about first, uh, pain you have to figure out what, why there is major pain. You know, I mean, if you've got a lot of pain in your shoulders, you need to figure out why that's there and get that treated. And strength training could be part and should be part of that treatment. Number two, you don't have to clear pain, um, or minimal pain or moderate pain before you start movement. Movement is part of the treatment. Again, uh, number three, there are some cases where you need to work the secondary stabilizer musculature, the smaller musculature in more isolated movements along with the big movers. Um, number four, which we haven't mentioned this, but we have elucidated it through our conversation is that the big exercises to create shoulder health long term are the, the larger compound movements, which would be the press, the bench press, the squat, the deadlift, um, barbell rows, I would throw in there, the chin. Those are the big exercises, the push up, weighted push ups, that if you do those exercises, you'll create really good shoulder health. Um, I had a question the other day about, you know, shouldn't we add rotational movements in of the trunk and shouldn't we add all these other things in? The reality is, is that the human body really works mostly in the sagittal plane or in the frontal plane for right. most of your movement. And so if we hit these major exercises, you're going to have a really good foundation for movement in these joints that you can apply in whatever manner you want. Right. Um, right. The fifth principle is that, um, and this is, this is something we haven't talked about. I mean, we haven't elucidated the principle directly, but now we're going to, and that is this, your mobility and flexibility. Your flexibility is your underlying joint range of motion. Your mobility is your ability to use it, whether it be due to lack of strength or lack of mo uh, actual joint range of motion, flexibility, whatever, right. or your movement learned pattern. Um, your flexibility and your mobility can be improved through strength training. Um, it, we, can, we can select certain exercise activities to improve your overhead shoulder flexion. Um, the low bar back squat, as an example, is a great stretch activity for the shoulder joint into external rotation to be able to get you to get more overhead. The chin is a great exercise to do um, to work on lat flexibility and the ability to hang in a complete overhead position and get that shoulder joint more open. Um, uh, all of these different exercises are great to build flexibility and mobility in your shoulder. And so you don't have to build all that mobility and the flexibility in the front end. 
before you start these exercise activities. Yeah. Now, if you're really over anteriorly developed, if you were a, an athlete, maybe like a gymnast or sometimes. Like a, I see rock climbers are or, like or this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a rock climber or, or you know, well, they, they don't have a ton of mass, muscle mass necessarily though, but let's say um, a power lifter. Or let's say a bench press champion. Sure, he's, yeah. He's basically all he's ever done or she's ever done bench is just only bench. meets. Yeah, you know, yeah. bench only meets. You know, that's all he's ever done. Um, he's really anteriorly developed. You know, he's got his pecs are huge, his anterior delts are huge, his biceps huge, his lats may be big too, but he's like got this forward postural position, shoulder position, and thoracic kyphosis, then we need to work on getting him more upright. We need to work on developing the posterior chain. We need to work on the musculature that are opposite to the tight musculature, the antagonist-agonist relationship. They work together and against each other. Right. And so we need to work on those musculature. And we need to select exercise interventions that will create the mobility and the flexibility that we want. And they may be involved with strength training. So the chin up is a strength training exercise, but when done in its fullest range of motion and hanging in the bottom, it's a flexibility mobility exercise. Of course. Yeah. The low bar back squat loaded stretch is a strength. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a perfect loaded stretch. Yep. Um, the low bar back squat is a strength training exercise. Um, or intervention, but when done correctly with the elbows tucked in and the grip really narrow and the shoulders externally rotated and the bar down low is a great stretch for the anterior chest, um, for uh, the anterior deltoid, for the anterior glenohumeral joint, the anterior capsule, um, and all these different structures that can get tight in someone that has a postural dysfunction, let's say. Sure, you know? sure. So we can use all these movements, and especially in an older person, we can use all these moose movements. And what they'll find is, I mean, I'll give you a good example. When I came into CrossFit years ago, over 10 years ago now, um, almost 10 years ago in two or three months, more than that, actually, 11 years ago, um, uh, I was uh, – pretty anteriorly developed as, as a, as a person, because I'd been a gymnast most of my life. And I was still pretty good at gymnastics, even uh, in an older age of my life. I sure. Just, I yeah. do a lot of skills still. Um, and, um, and then I went into CrossFit and I didn't do chin-ups anymore. I did mostly pull-ups. And, um, what was weird was I, all I ever did was pull-ups. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and at first, you know, and I, and I got, I did the pull-ups, more pull-ups, more pull-ups. I did a lot of pulling, you know, I did a lot of those motions and then it got to where I got s even more anteriorly developed. You think the pull-up would have helped me, but what happens is my lats got even tighter. Um, and then the first time I went to go do chins again, when I, you know, be, you know, later in, in my career, I became a starting strength coach and we did a lot of chins and, and I couldn't even get my hand, uh, my arms fully supinated right, yeah. and internally wrote, externally rotated and adducted to reach the bar. Um, and so it took me time, but I just continued to do those. I went from a wider grip to a little bit narrow grip, to a little bit narrow grip, to a little bit narrow grip. And now I can do a full hang and I can reach up without. So the exercise strengthening intervention in and of itself was a loaded dynamic stretch, right. which is the most effective form of stretching that we know of um, in getting mobility and flexibility back in joints and in muscles and tendons and ligaments. So that's the fifth overreaching principle is that your strength training program um, and your exercise inventions, interventions can be your stretches in and of themselves. And then you might have people do some isolated um, uh, stretching exercises. Um, um, and when we're talking about the shoulder in particular, I might have them do just bar stretches on their off days and on their on days when they're training. If they're going to come in and squat one day, they do several bar stretches before they go into their warm up. They get up under the bar and they pull the bar down to its low position tucked and you hold it for 30 seconds and they might do three to five of those before they start their warm up sets. And then um, on their off days, because just stretching every other day is not enough on their off days for some of these ladies and guys, right. I'll have them do that same stretch. They just go into a rack under a rack somewhere or a bar, or they use a wooden dowel at home, whatever. But I want them to get up under it and press that bar down to that position and get those shoulders externally rotated, adducted, and get a big chest and get that scapular retraction. Yes. So yeah. they're, you know, for stretching isolated stretches to be effective, they have to be done every day. Right. And right. not only do they have to be done every day, they have to probably be done two or three times a day. Okay? Ideally. Yep. And so, um, and we're doing two things there. Not only are we stretching the tissue with that stretch, we're also learning good motor patterns, right? Which is part of this, right? That's just like we said in the, 
flexibility yeah. mobility yeah. uh, episode that uh, motor patterns play a part that maybe the thing that we think about least we think about the tissue being you know in, in the tight being tight yeah. that's yeah. that's the main thing but there's also a motor pattern you got to learn what that feels like and how to get in the right position so yeah and i think it's I good think, practice yeah eyes on coaching really helps good quality movement i mean um you know learning to do the motion correctly getting all the 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 movement in its sequence down right and whatever I, the motion I, is. I say that because we see very often when we have uh people come in the gym for form checks or we do yeah. squat camps. Um, a very, very common problem with a squat is people take the bar out of the rack and it's not in the bar might be in the right place on the shoulders, but the, the grip is incorrect, right? Right. It's very common to see that. So it's important to have a good motor pattern as well. Yeah. I mean, bar placement sets the stage, your stance and your bar placement for the squat um, for the, for the deadlift no, sure. or anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you want to think of your stance as where you're lying on the bench in a bench press, you know, and where your arms go on the bar, your bar placement and your stance sets the lift f- for the rest of the lift to be successful or not. It, it is, it is, it is what sets up the lift to be successful. And that's, that's the key. And so I think with any of these principles, with these five principles that we're talking about, um, I think the key here is, is that if you have, so if you have a shoulder pathology, if you've been told you have a torn rotator cuff, um, don't wait to start a strength training program to get pain free, go out and find a good, a good strength coach, find a starting strength coach in your area, find a CrossFit coach that has a lot of barbell training and has done some work with the older population, done some work with, with, uh, members that have shoulder problems, uh, find a local DPT doctor of physical therapy. That's got a lot of experience in orthopedics, maybe an orthopedic certified specialist as I am, or someone that's done a lot of shoulder work. I mean, I did my doctorate work on the shoulder. I did a paper on my shoulders on the shoulder. So, um, find someone with some knowledge base, um, and then start a program with, um, first of all, if you have a ton of pain and it's, you got to get that calmed down. So modalities might be in order. Manual therapy might be in order. Corticosteroids might be in order. NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories might be appropriate. Um, rest, a little bit of rest might be appropriate. Um, I had a client that came in, um, my, my, my physical therapy office in Keller is right next door to an orthopedist office and he's a close friend of mine. And we, we share patients back and forth and we talk over cases back and forth. And he called me into his office last week, last Wednesday. And he had a client, he said, look at this x-ray. And I looked at the x-ray and, and, uh, x-rays are not supposed to show, um, bony structures, um, in tendons or in muscles. Um, they x-rays show bones mostly, right. and they will show anything that's a densified material like cal- calcium deposits, chunks of bone, big thick cysts. Sometimes they'll show up too. Right. Space occupying top lesions. And so I look at his shoulder and he, and I, he shows me the shoulder view and I go, uh, there's a pretty bad calcium deposit right there. That's right on his supraspinatus. He said, yep. And there was a large, probably about the size of the end of my finger from my DIP joint, my pinky finger to the end of it. There was a large chunk of calcium right where his, um, supraspinatus tendon attaches into the uh, bone. Okay. Yeah. So it had so, a lot of trauma, obviously. Right. So that so calcific tendonitis, just chronic inflammation that caused that, that chronic inflammation cal- going from, like we talked about in prior, right. ep- the prior episode, yep. chronic inflammation going from tendonitis mm-hmm. to tendinosis to tendinopathy. Yeah. Okay. And this was a tendinosis to tendinopathy type stage. Until actual physical changes to yeah, the tissue. Structural, structural changes, changes to the tendon. Yeah. And so, um, uh, so I said, all right, he's going to send him over for physical therapy and we're going to do some strengthening on him. I said, great. So right then the doctor did a corticosteroid injection of dexamethasone and lidocaine to into the subarticular space, um, to bathe that tendon in steroid and to reduce the inflammation. So here's what I told him. I said, between now today and Wednesday, I don't want to see you in my clinic until next Monday at the earliest. I said, I want to give this corticosteroid about three to five days um, to reduce the inflammation in your shoulder and shrink that tissue down to give us more space to move that tendon and get the inflammatory process down. But don't be fooled. If you come in on Monday and you're pain free in all motion, it's not been fixed. It's not been fixed. Very likely you've been compensating 
and that rotator cuff, that supraspinatus and infraspinatus and subscapularis and teres is weak because you've been painful. He couldn't raise his arm above 90 degrees out to the side, and he couldn't raise his arm in the front more than about 90 to 100 degrees. He hadn't done overhead movement in, in several weeks and months. So, so I said, you've probably got some compensations in there. So I said, um, and some weakness. So come in on Monday at the earliest. We'll take a look at you. And then I told him that steroid's going to act um, in your shoulder. It's going to be um, acting because of its half-life for a couple of weeks. It's going to be effective in shrinking that tissue down. Yeah. I said, so if you feel better within three to five days, it's not the pain medication. It's the actual anti-inflammatory. Right. The condition is improved. But then we need to flush that tendon with blood and tension to see what's what it's going to tolerate through strength training and resistance training and through tendon training so that looks a little different than what i would do with the person that doesn't have a significant tendon problem when i get to a guy like that in the clinic so he came in monday yesterday yeah, yep because today's tuesday folks we do our podcast recordings on tuesdays normally so he came in yesterday into the clinic he was pain-free almost he had normal range of motion and his strength was actually really good so what I did was I put him on a resistance training program. His mobility of the joint was, was near normal. Um, his pain level was a one out of two with o extreme overhead flexion, external rotation, extreme ranges of motion, no pain at rest. Yep. I said, keep taking the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories the doctor gave you, and let's start you on some tendon rehab. So what we did was four sets of 15 to 20 reps, lighter resistance, just to engorge that tendon with blood in some more isolated movements. We also started an overhead press, very light, higher reps, lower loads. And we did some arm bike just to flush that tendon with blood to get some lubrication in that joint, to get the joint more vascular, to get the tendon as vascular as we can get it. And, um, and gave him a home program for him to do at home. That's exactly how I would treat this person. Yeah, I didn't do yeah. ice with him. Um, because he, he doesn't have any pain. The inflammatory conditions um, uh, calm down. Right. Um, but I told him you can do it ice at home if you want to. Um, but he's, do, he's to do his program every day, and he's to follow up with me at the end of the week on Friday. And then we'll continue to add load, drop the reps down over time, using pain as our predictor and quality of movement. And then we'll, we'll continue to add the big movers in and add more and more load, more and more load over time. Um, and that's how we're training. So, you know, it's rehab slash training. It's, it's in some ways in my environment, it can be the same because right. of my dual role. But that's a great example of, of what we do with our clients and how strength training can be used as an intervention for you as the listening audience out there. But you first, number one, got to figure out if you got a real problem, you got a lot of pain. Number two, you don't have to get rid of all your pain before you start strength training and clear the dysfunctional movement. Number three, and there are some cases where you need to work the secondary stabilizers along with the bigger compound movements. And usually it's when there's been significant pathology or damage to those stabilizers or they've shut down or, you know, all the different diagnoses that can be there. Number four, we talked about the fact that the bigger uh, compound movements are the, are the best at developing shoulder health. And number five, we talked about the fact that a lot of these interventions can be the way that we get your flexibility and mobility back. Right. And right. so yeah. those are the principles for shoulder interventions. We talked about all these exercises that we do. Um, my general rule of thumb is the set and rep scheme for someone that's got a dysfunctional, painful shoulder. I'm going to have higher reps and lower loads, like 15 to 20 reps and lower loads and more sets on the front end. And then I'm going to gradually decrease the low, decrease the rep scheme, increase the loads um, over time. Um, and there are some cases where I will also intervene if there's not a significant structural integrity issue in structures. There are some cases where I might do one or two sets a little heavier at much lower loads and then add in two to three sets of much lighter load work. Cause I like the stimulus that the high load, yeah. um, uh, lower rep count does is a really good growth hormone stimulus, really good testosterone and chemical stimulus. Can I get the best of both worlds yeah. with that approach? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As yeah. long as I'm not going to damage the structure. Yeah. yeah. So man, that's a, it's a real generic, um, you know, over the top flight, but I think, um, these are some really good principles that you can apply to your shoulders for your shoulder health and some interventions that you can use. Yeah, you know, as we covered, uh, when we go back to the, the first major body part we covered, lower back, 
Uh, we talked about pain a lot and pain science. And we're talking about the shoulder. We're talking about basic concepts for rehab. This is stuff you can apply all over the body, right? Sure. Not, not sure. necessarily specific to the shoulder, principles. right? Yeah. Exactly. So as we go through the, di- the various parts of the body, we're going we're gonna to outline these, these principles that you can use anywhere in your training rehab program. Yeah. So, well, yeah. thanks guys for joining 40 Fit Radio for another episode. Thank you for joining the 40 Fit Nation. As always, go check us out on 40fit.com. You can find us on Instagram at 40 Fit Radio. You can see Coach D, Dr. D at DL Deaton. I'm at Marmalade Cream. And finally, you can find us on Facebook at 40 Fit Masters Community. Leave us a question. If you have anything, you know, if, if you have any questions about shoulder health or something specific to your situation that you want to work out, then shoot us a question on social media. Send us an email at info at 40fit.com and we'll do our best to answer it. Yeah. And we get several emails a week um, at, you know, at info at 40fit.com. And sometimes I get them to my personal email, my coaching email that uh, Trent does too, where, you know, we have clients or listeners who, who have questions about their specific circumstances. We'll help you as much as we can. And sometimes we're going to, we might not necessarily give you um, something to drink, but we might lead you to water. And, uh, and that's the key. We want you to be able to be inquisitive and, and logical and we want you to find some of your own solutions and we do that by leading you to the right sources to get the right um, interventions the right solution the right knowledge whatever it is and then you can then you can be much more effective in the future long term with some of these principles Um, the, the last thing is man guys on social media specifically on Instagram if you follow us on Instagram get other people to follow us share our page please send us reviews on the podcast we're really growing Uh, the good thing is our listening audience has grown for 2019 the first two months of the year have been a a lot of growth for us Um, but also comment on our post and on our episodes if you have if we post the new episode that's come out on Instagram Um, And it's going to be on shoulder health interventions this time. And you have a question, put your question down there. And Coach Trent and I will get to that question within the same day, if if not within the same hour. So our goal is we want to be a resource for you. We want to be a source of logic, reason, and knowledge. Man, have a great day out there. And thanks for joining the 40 Fit Nation.